Hello everyone. Today in this video, I will talk with you about reflections and reflective practices of educators in early childhood education. The topic of reflection in early childhood education is often met with a mixture of admiration and frustration. Yes, we all know that reflection is a critical piece of an early childhood educator's toolbox, a component of practice that deepens our appreciation of and understanding of young children. We admire those who do this. However, finding the right time for it amid busy schedules, packed days, and mounting obligations can be difficult, if not frustrating. What then? can we do to encourage our colleagues and ourselves to find and create time for this reflection that we know is so valuable in our day-to-day -day practice. Rooted in wonder. Reflective practices are rooted in wonder. Wonder here refers to the disposition of curiosity that is taken towards an event or phenomenon that we observe. This wonder in turn serves as the central motivation behind one's reflection, leading eventually to a rabbit hole down which an educator feels motivated to travel. This motivation, especially when it is intrinsic, is an important catalyst for reflection. Next way to get into these reflective practices is asking why and what if questions. A wandering disposition in turn invites educators into questions that begin in why and what if. Asking why and what if questions can deepen an educator's understanding of children's interactions and also deepen the educator's understanding of their reaction and role in learning. Children's exploration of themes such as superheroes, animals or royalties or the exploration of a certain artistic material are often common entry points for wonder. Imagine for example that the children in your care are endlessly intrigued by a game of kittens which they enact through a series of rough tackles, dog piles, and endless laughters. A child-centered why might ask, why are the children so enthralled by this game? Why do the children insist on rough play as part of this game? An educator-centered why might wonder, why am I, as an educator, so unsettled by the children's rough and tumble cross motor play? Whereas a child centered what if might ask, what if the children had other ways to explore the juxtaposition of roughness and tenderness? What if we discussed the purpose and role of rough play in baby animals? Where might this lead and what might it reveal? An educator-centered what if might wonder, what if I change the language I use to describe play to myself, my colleagues and in my documentation? What if I made efforts to find a more precise, respectful accent to describe the unfolding work of the children? Making time in your practice. How can we make time for our reflective practices as an educator? Just as no one child's work will be exactly the same in process or in content as the work of another, so too does each reflective practice look different. That is the beauty of an authentic reflective practice. However, there are a few principles that might be handy for those seeking to begin, sustain or reimagine a reflective practice.
practice. You are already reflecting as part of your ongoing work as an educator. As early educators, our entire day is anchored in children. We ask questions about children, we gather data and information about children, about what they know, what they are learning, and the ways they experience in the world, and so on. Reframing and rephrasing daily practices and inquiries. The language we use has an important impact on the way we view the world. It is why we are so careful to use precise language with young children. Observing a child spending time writing letters and letter-like forms on a sheet of paper, we might move from asking, what does this child know about letters, to something like, I wonder what about letters is intriguing this to this child, their forms, their communicative potential. Incorporating others into the reflective process. Another efficient way to reflect is to embed it into classroom rituals that already exist, folding others into the process, for example, your colleagues and children. A simple conversation over snack time counts as reflection, as does wondering, asking, speaking and thinking with children. This might occur during a regular meeting time. As you walk from one room to the other or over a weekend coffee. Another way of a reflective practice is making time in your environment and context. In that book, From Teaching to Thinking, Anne Pillow and Margaret Cater notes that reflective practices can only exist when they are promoted and provided from the vision and values that anchor organizational systems. A critical component of reflective practice and teacher research is making time, not only in classroom-based practice, but within the institutional structures within which educators exist. Making time isn't necessarily easy, but it is worthwhile. To begin, one might wonder, what works for me? When am I most excited to think about the classroom? Is it in the middle of the day, as the event unfolds, during a scheduled planning time? The truth is that there is no way around it. Reflective practice takes time. However, it need not be laborious. Now we have discussed several reflective practices like wondering, asking why and what if questions, making time in your practice, reframing and rephrasing daily practices and inquiries, incorporating others into the reflective process, and finally, making time in your environment and context. Now let's discuss about the fruits of reflection. Fruits of reflection are the benefits that we get through the reflective process as an educator. The fruits of reflection are increased intentionality, more trenched habits of inquiry and perspective shifts that have the potential to impact the way we view ourselves, our colleagues and the children with whom we work. The first fruit of reflection is intentionality. Reflection and intentionality are closely related, perhaps even mutually informative pair. Reflection leads to intentionality and an intentional stance necessarily incorporates reflection. For example, when you watch patiently as children enact through play, rituals of baking, eating and dressing, you might reflect on anything from what 
children wave as the most important about these rituals to the souls of Russians you'd like to discuss with the children at your next meeting relating to this play, to something you might bring up with a co-worker or a colleague, to your own wondering about how these rituals connect to broader social norms, etc. The second fruit of reflection is habits of inquiry. Reflective practices also help us establish habits of wondering and inquiry. When we are able to incorporate reflective minutes, reflective rituals, and reflective frames of mind into our ongoing daily work, these habits of inquiry become increasingly second nature. This means that we will begin to be reflective right where we are. As we intend a faculty or staff meeting, as we work with children to navigate conflict, as we observe children's play, happening, flowing and evolving. The third fruit of reflection is perspective shift. Reflecting frequently and in the company of others invites us to look outside of ourselves and our own experiences of answers. This occurs through discussion and dialogue with ourselves, others, ideas, etc. When we reflect, even on our own previous conceptions, we learn to let go of our established ideas and frameworks. This propels us onwards in the search of more answers that will lead us along the path of wonder. The most important thing we can do as educators is to maintain a reflective disputation towards our practice. There is always room to begin new, deepen your existing practice and to discern what works best for your particular interests, needs and context. Reflection and its fruits are ultimately a testament to an image of children as capable human beings who lead rich lives, hold complex ideas and experiences the world deeply. Here are some questions to keep with you. Where do you have room in your days for reflective practices? Where might you find reflective minutes? It may be before the class starts, it may be after the children are gone. Is there anything about your current classroom children center that makes you wonder why or what if? Who can you recruit to begin a journey of reflection with? A co-worker or a colleague? The children in your classroom or center? A community online? Here are some reflective practice strategies. Create a supportive culture, observe and document, establish opportunities, listen actively, adjust your approach, reflect collaboratively, provide PD and training. What are the roles of reflective practice? in child-centered education. The first role is to individualize instructions. It go beyond behavior and it support social emotional development of the children and it promotes problem solving and executive function skills. Here are some questions for your reflection. How do I provide extended time for investigations? How do I scaffold learning through a variety of ways? How do I plan and create experiences that are inclusive and culturally responsive? How do I create a welcoming, warm and supportive environment for each individual child? 
How do I create flexible environments that are responsive to children's interests and spontaneity? You may be an early childhood educator that has never involved in reflective practices. So, how to get started? As you become familiar with reflective pr practices, there are a variety of ways to begin documenting your reflections. Through documenting it enables you as well as other educators to acknowledge, understand and recognize thoughts, perceptions and views on different issues and topics. Now let's discuss several ways in which reflective practices can be documented. The first way is journaling. Reflective journals or diaries is a simple and effective way for you to begin to record your thinking about all your practices like relationships, interactions, teaching and learning process, assessments and environments and so on. The second method of documenting your reflective practices is through an online website. You can create a social media site or a page for you and the educators you work with to encourage and support one another by sharing reflections. It is a good way of encouraging contributions since most people enjoy using social media sites. Blogs are also another way to create a shared learning space online. The third way of expressing your reflections during your reflective practices is through meetings. During staff meetings, time spent discussing practices with all educators ensure that reflections become a regular process. Whole meetings can be developed specifically around reflections, while others, a certain amount of time can be given within the meeting. Meetings also do not need to include all educators to reflect on practices. Meetings can be split, split or based upon educators working with specific age groups, room, room leaders and assistants. It's important that during these meetings that there is a facilitator available who can help guide the reflective process by asking questions for critical thinking and stimulate discussions. Discussions during meetings should be recorded and documented. Director, educator, mentor is someone who asks questions, who guides you, offers a different perspective, who challenges and encourages you face to face or over the phone or even online. The final way that I'm discussing to document your reflective practices is through notice boards. Reflective notice boards can be used in the staff room and each room for highlighting reflective practice. Posters, quotes, questions, articles, images can all be used to promote thinking and discussion. Each week, a question can be added onto the notice board where educators can write their comments and responses too. Further discussions on this can be supported in the staff meeting. That's all for this video. Hope 